and welcome to the program. Ukraine is marking five years since Russia's occupation and subsequent annexation of Crimea. Kremlin leader Vladimir Putin didn't really attempt to conceal his imperialistic ambitions there. One year after Moscow's land grab, in a documentary, Putin admitted that Russian troops seized the Black Sea Peninsula. So if it hasn't been a secret for years, why are some members of the international community keeping a business-as-usual attitude towards Russia? Joining us today to discuss this and more is German politician and member of European Parliament, Rebecca Harms. Thank you so much for coming in and uh, welcome back to Kiev. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. So just to kind of start start things off, um, in The Guardian, uh, an open letter was published. It was signed by 11 foreign ministers and it was titled The West Must Not Abandon Crimea and Ukraine to Russian Aggression. Very strong headline there. And it talked about the seemingly endless, you know, campaign uh, against Crimean Tatars in the, in the Black Sea Peninsula by the Russian uh, occupation forces and about the 24 captured Ukrainian sailors and demands for the for their release. Um, however, uh, the French and the German foreign ministers did not sign this open letter. Now, they are also the, usually when the Normandy format talks happen, these are the two sides that are key in the negotiations be between Ukraine and Russia. And yet they didn't sign this important letter. And it's, you know, the f five, five years since the annexation. So it's very, very important. Um, Without knowing the full details why, uh, do you think there would be any reason for them not to sign it? I read uh, this uh, open letter or uh, opinion article uh, late uh, yesterday evening after I had joined uh, the conference uh, on Crimea uh, five years after the start of the occupation and uh, after five years also of resistance of uh, many Crimean Tatars and Ukrainians in uh, Crimea. And I read the article, I liked it, uh, then I was looking for the signatures and I was honestly shocked that I couldn't find the signature of my German foreign affairs minister, Mr. Heiko Maas. And I really do not know why. So in a second round of thinking, uh, I thought, uh, so if he and also the French uh, foreign minister uh, have not joined, uh, then they should at least have come up uh, with an own statement because uh, they are responsible for uh, the, the Minsk talks. They are responsible for any sort of peace negotiations that go on between Ukraine and Russia. This was right from the start of the conflict. Merkel and Hollande were there. And then their, their they representatives. They wanted to be there. So uh, yeah, they, they wanted to do this in this um, so EU uh, format or German, French, uh, Russian, Ukrainian format. And they explicitly were against continuation of the Geneva format. So they, they must show uh, more, um, not only more attention, but also more dedication. This, uh, so yesterday's, uh, the yesterday's missing signatures, uh, I think, uh, were seen by many Ukrainians with the same shock uh, as it happened uh, to me. And um, I think um, also um, what makes it more severe is a tendency in uh, Germany and in the ministry in Germany uh, to make the two sides uh, in this war equal. Uh, this is a problem since long uh, that the Germans appeal always uh, to the two sides in what they call the conflict. Often they even not say it's a war and they make the aggressor, Mr. Putin, uh, equal uh, to the Ukrainian people uh, who are under attack by Mr. Putin. I, I think that, that this brings us to the point where uh, last month, uh, um, uh, the German foreign minister Heiko Maas, um, he said he was during, during a visit in Kiev and he was standing right beside Pavlo Klimkin, the Ukrainian foreign, foreign minister, and he said, all sides need to contribute to the de-escalation. Now, wh how do you respond to that? Uh, what sort of impression does that give? So don't make the aggressor, Mr. Putin, equal uh, to uh, those who are responsible for Ukraine. Ukraine is under attack. Uh, Putin invaded first Crimea and then went uh, to war uh, in Donbas against Ukraine. And Putin went uh, to war and continues this war and the occupation until now against the sovereign decision of uh, Ukraine uh, to have an association agreement uh, with 
with uh, the European Union. And for the European Union, it's very important to be clear about this and uh, to talk uh, the, the truth about this, uh, because they cannot accept uh, that in Moscow, in the Kremlin, somebody like Mr. Putin uh, decides um, who can have agreements uh, with uh, the European Union. It's a sovereign decision uh, of Ukraine and other states, and it's a decision of Brussels not to be doubted or attacked uh, by the Kremlin. That's right. And how do you think that plays into, or, or how that even looks when uh, Germany is also backing the Nord Stream 2 pipeline? So this is a long, long story. Um, and uh, so you know that in the European Parliament uh, and in the European institutions, uh, we were trying everything uh, to not allow Germany to treat this as a German, uh, a G a German um, business uh, or um, business as a normal um, business as usual in between uh, two states uh, or two companies. Um, and uh, we did not succeed fully. Uh, but I think uh, it was uh, a success to achieve uh, that uh, all pipelines which arrive uh, from third countries uh, in uh, the territory of the European Union in the future have to comply uh, with uh, the EU rules, uh, the EU internal market rules. Uh, this will change the conditions, at least for Nord Stream 2, it's not sufficient. Yesterday I saw that uh, the um, uh, energy minister of Russia announced uh, that um, as soon as Nord Stream 2 uh, starts to work um, and will deliver natural gas uh, to uh, Germany, uh, they will end the transit of natural gas uh, through, through Ukrainian pipelines. So the, the reaction um, of uh, the Russian side was as we from Brussels always predicted. And this shows uh, that uh, the pipelines are an instrument, a political instrument. You can also say they are weapons uh, of Russia uh, to control what's uh, going on uh, in their neighborhood. And um, EU and Germany have to rethink this project, especially also to the backdrop uh, that uh, Russia is investing all the money they are making with natural gas and other energy exports. They are investing this in their army. Uh, they are investing it even in new nuclear weapons um, and uh, rockets uh, to transport uh, those uh, nuclear warheads in case. That's right. And this actually, is really right. targeting, it's targeting the European Union. Um, and um, we cannot in this situation uh, continue uh, to fuel uh, this uh, military complex uh, of Russia with our money. A percentage of that equipment ed ends up on Ukraine's borders, near Ukraine's borders. So we see a buildup. Uh, it ends heard also in, uh, especially in Crimea. Uh, so the militarization uh, of uh, Crimea, the militarization of the whole Black Sea region, uh, but also uh, more weapons in Kaliningrad, for example. So it's a challenge uh, for Ukraine. It's also the same challenge for many of the EU member states. And uh, I think uh, Germany should really not decide alone uh, on this important part of our security uh, strategy, which is uh, really um, so part uh, of this energy strategy. Right, and uh, Europe is trying to be independent of, of Russian energy, of Russian gas. We especially. should, we should. That's right. uh, so far, uh, the dependence uh, of um, uh, imports from Russia in the European Union is increasing instead of decreasing. Uh, do you think Russia's interests are still uh, being fulfilled by, by Europe, even if some politicians such as yourself don't, don't, don't want that to happen? Uh, so let's see what's really going to happen. I found it also uh, today in the morning very uncomfortable uh, that uh, so uh, we um, see um, news from the United States under the title The Fixer and uh, this is not a soap opera. Uh, or a TV serial. Uh, it's about a real story uh, which happened uh, so uh, t <laughs> because uh, the uh, president of the United States needed a fixer. 
Um, and uh, in, in, in Brussels, you know, uh, we are going uh, to uh, leave uh, the parliament um, and this legislation soon for going to the election campaign. We do not know what's going to happen. But for example, from Italy, we learned uh, that uh, the Minister for Interior, Mr. Salvini, uh, got uh, already three, uh, three uh, million uh, for his uh, right-wing, extreme right-wing election campaign, a campaign clearly against uh, EU and uh, European values and in favor of uh, so better and normal relations to a dictator like Vladimir Putin. Uh, so um, we are facing uh, some problems, I hope, uh, that uh, electorate uh, will be uh, more reasonable um, and uh, will resist uh, to the influence uh, of nationalists um, and uh, people uh, who want to destroy what we have achieved in uh, peace building, democracy, democracy building uh, in the European Union after the, the last decades. That's right. Uh, so, oh, you know, going 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 back to some of the things that have been happening over the over the past days, weeks, um, uh, a scandal uh, erupted in uh, Brussels over um, over the fact that uh, uh, the uh, uh, Vladimir Putin's spokesperson's daughter, um, Elizaveta Piskova, uh, has been working as an intern for um, a far right French MEP. This has made a lot of people angry in Ukraine because. Brussels is seen as an institution of democracy. Uh, the, the the European Parliament is seen as as the heart of democracy in Europe, and yet we have a uh, the daughter of the Kremlin's spokesperson working there, uh, getting a. Uh, uh, getting a, a salary of a thousand euros a month. And, um, and probably she doesn't need it. And she definitely <laughs> does not need it. We it's, know that. We yeah, know that. So, um, so that the happy few uh, of uh, Russia probably profiting a lot from uh, stealing money uh, from uh, Russian citizens uh, because they have the opportunities uh, as friends of Vladimir Putin. Uh, so it's it's bizarre that uh, such a, a student um, makes money uh, in addition in the European institutions. Uh, but much more um, uh, bizarre for me is still uh, that uh, daughter of a man who uh, is uh, blaming and shaming uh, the European Union as uh, <laughs> her father did, that this daughter wants uh, to be a stagiaire in the European institutions. Uh, what also uh, gets obvious, uh, so the right-wingers in the European Union are friends uh, of Vladimir Putin and his uh, clique. Um, and uh, yes, every, every member of the European Parliament decides on its own. My stagiaires uh, came very often from Ukraine. Uh, this cannot uh, be so he cannot heal this uh, scandal which was discovered uh, during the last days. Uh, but I think uh, many more members of the European Parliament have stagiaires uh, from Ukraine. And we hope uh, that uh, our investment in good skills uh, of young Ukrainians uh, will make Ukrainian the better place. Well, let's let, let's hope there are more Ukrainian hard hardworking students, you know, getting the opportunity. But they are hardworking. I, t I can tell you. So um, the uh, Ukrainian stagiaires I had in my office uh, were um, among uh, the nicest stagiaires I had. I'm in contact uh, with all of them still. And uh, I hope they will contribute uh, to a democratic and uh, good development in Ukraine. And uh, so in Russia, there are probably young people who deserve much more than uh, this, uh, this uh, student. Uh, they deserve much more to be stagiaires in the European Parliament. Well, I, I'm sure there, there must be hundreds, if, if not more, uh, Russian students who would have really appreciated and have really benefited from a position in the European Union Parliament mm. uh, than Elisaveta Piskova, who has, I'm sure, plenty of opportunities thanks to her father, the spokesman, sp spokesperson for the Kremlin. Um, you know, um, moving on. Um, so this week uh, marks five years since Russia's invasion of, U of, of Crimea. And uh, you attended a forum here in Kiev and you discussed human rights abuses in the peninsula and how the Russian occupation authorities target the ethnic Crimean Tatar po population there. Um, 
what convincing strategy did what convincing strategies did you hear to get Crimea back? Um, I think it's very difficult to predict uh, what's going uh, to happen uh, with uh, Crimea, um, and uh, there were on the. Uh, on the one side, many people who wishes, like I do, uh, to see Crimea uh, back in Ukraine and to be able to go there uh, and enjoy this uh, wonderful part of uh, Ukraine. Uh, I, I'm not sure what's going uh, to happen, uh, but what I'm sure about is uh, that uh, so the situation uh, in Crimea as well as the situation in occupied uh, Donbas region uh, deserves much more attention and the severe human rights violations taking place uh, in Crimea and uh, in parts of Donbas under occupation, under Russian occupation, uh, deserves much more attention. We have to break the silence. Uh, this was one of the messages. Um, and um, the international community has to do more uh, to uh, survey the situation uh, on the spot. Uh, so there was a lot of discussion again about a necessary and ongoingly United Nations mission. Uh, I'm also very much in favor of repeating also towards Heiko Maas uh, that the situation in the Sea of Azov needs to be part, active part uh, of the OSZE uh, special monitoring mission uh, to Ukraine. Uh, so that at least what's going on there uh, is, um, is known and is spread as information uh, to the world. That's right. If, it's, if there's monitors on the ground, uh, perhaps human rights violators and uh, the, the Russian occupation forces wouldn't be so blatant in their attacks and, <clears throat> excuse me, and in their, you know, any, 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 any sort of illegal activity. Um, thank you so much for coming to join me today in the studio. With pleasure, always. We've been joined by German politician and member of European Parliament, Rebecca Harms. You're watching UATV.